So my name is Joanna Keen Lopez, and I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I received my Bachelor's of Fine Art over there um, in 2016. I, um, through my father's family, my father, Damasio Lopez, we have an old land grant in Socorro, New Mexico called Lopezville. And it dates back to about 1815 when they gave out about uh, land to about 60 to 70 families. And so it's right next to New Mexico Tech, which is the mining college over there. And on that property, are different homes that have been built through since since that time um, and this is one of them a house that my father recently gave to me and this was taken in the 80s and a large part of my practice kind of goes back to Lopezville so I just wanted to give you a um, like a little journey through it and so this is him actually remodeling it where he began to put river rocks onto the facade of the of the Adobe home and this actually began as a cochetta like a little like garage kind of and then became kind of like a casita and um and so I've always been interested in this idea of, of vernacular architecture and vernacular architecture is literally using whatever is there and available and so this home and the other homes were built just with the dirt that was right there. My dad just went to the river, the vigas in there from the mountains, like nothing cost any money. <laughs> like it's like all scraps or things that were just found. And so that's vernacular architecture. And it also is, this is when he finished it. Wow. Yeah, so it's very, it's also this concept of resquache. And so resquache is sort of this kind of underdog aesthetic of using whatever is available to kind of create this new, um, very unique aesthetic that's just kind of just comes from using what you had. And so my father has always had this really interesting way of, of doing that, especially with building. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to kind of show some of these and the, across the street is another home built by my great grandfather, Avelino and, um, there's just so many beautiful details in there with, with uh, the, uh, the interior, um, with the vigas, or they used to put mante de techos. It's like a big uh, like Muslim cloth underneath the vigas to catch the dirt. It's a very old technique. And in there, you can see all of the, the mante just hanging from the rafters and they painted it blue. So it's just kind of these beautiful, uh, using what's available and then including um, like this artistic element into it with the beautification of Adobe architecture. And but one thing about, this is sort of, um, this is sort of the road of Lopezville and there's all these different homes. And one thing about it is throughout time, you can see that the original homes were all made from, from Adobe. And then as time went on, you can see that it was Adobe and then cinder block homes. Hi. And then from there, it was um, wood and then stucco frame. And then from there, it moved into trailers. And so it's this furthering and furthering away that you could really see on this land, the family land, uh, furthering away from land-based vernacular architectural practices and towards more of this concept of modernization um, and assimilation as well. And so, my father always says that when he was growing up, he's 78, he was born in 1943. And he always says growing up that being, you know, living in a mud home and it was seen as being very poor. And so as in the forties, especially in fifties, there was a big push to stop speaking Spanish as well as covering up the fact that you live in a mud home. And so that also came with um, stuccoing it or moving away into wood frame and, and also whatever is available, right? Like trailers are cheap and available. And back then mud homes were cheap and available. But as people move away from communities and small towns or there's a lot of trauma within families, that infrastructure to, to maintain an Adobe home or have the labor force to even build one because it's so labor intensive isn't there anymore. And so you see less and less of, of um, Adobe homes being built in traditional 
communities. It's, it's not as uh, common anymore. And um, so, so I became very interested in understanding this, this element of thinking about land and um, family and community and traditional practices and what does it mean? It all, for me, it all comes from a place of loss. And so at now over in Lopezville, pretty much no one lives there and people have either died or have been incarcerated or have moved away because there's no work over there. Um, so a lot of the homes are just, are just um, they're abandoned or have been even um, foreclosed on. And so th and this is not a unique story. It's very common throughout New Mexico and other places, extremely common. And so, um, I just want to give like a good background of where I, I kind of came um, to a lot of this work. And so this is the mountain, the Socorro Mountain right behind. And this is the land that you can see from the backyard. And to the left is actually the Institute of, um, of it's the mining school. So I'm going to talk more about that because there actually has been a lot of testing that they used to do, especially in the 70s and 80s and currently. And so along with thinking about earthen materials for the vernacular architecture, I've always been interested in, in plants as well and medicinal plants. And so I'm going to move the conversation a little bit into another sphere that I also work in and come back to clay. This is chamisa, um, also known as rabbit brush, and it makes a really beautiful yellow dye. And so I became very interested in plants and medicinal plants and what, um, what they can do. And so my practice also is a lot about fibers and, and dyes, as well as um, mineral pigments, which we'll talk about later in my demonstration. So this was um, from a workshop that I did in Tierra Amaria at Tierra Wools. Uh, they do these really wonderful workshops on dyes. And so this is with the Chinisa making a yellow dye. This is with cochineal. Um, it's a little insect that nests on the prickly pear cactus and the female insects. It looks like spider webs and it makes this beautiful red dye. Are any of you familiar with the cochineal? I'm sure, maybe? Oh, no? Oh. Yeah, the, in, the insect, yeah, but it looks like it, yeah. I'm actually about to go to Oaxaca tomorrow and do a materials residency, and we're talking about clay and cochineal. Yeah, yeah, it's the female that nests on there, and then the males are the ones that fly around. Yeah, and so, and so along um, with being really interested in Adobe architecture, as I was saying, I have become really interested in dyes. So I, I practiced a lot with um, on fabric and as well with paper. And one of the things I think a lot about with my practice is I don't necessarily think of my studio as this, this room that I have with four walls. Like I've thought of my studio as like, who is my community? Like who are in my community? Who what what does the land like what is the land like what is the, the memory here what um I, i've just thought about my my studio in um like in a larger way of the the landscape and community and so a lot of all the practices i've learned have really come from learning from a lot of other other people and ultimately i've been teaching myself and so this was from um my my uh, BFA honors thesis exhibition and I was thinking about the concept of home and shelter and materials and so these were um, called Oda La Fuente Ode to Source and they're just these little kind of they're about like six foot by six foot and they're different studies on on shelter and home using paper and wire and all those are natural dyes used with casein which is a milk-based glue and then um, wool, some adobes, um, and then the white is actually paper mache, and then I painted it with alice, which is a clay slip paint. So it's actually earthen um, uh, painted. And I'm going to talk more about the alice in my demonstration and later. Those are wonderful. Where do they, where do they live now? Oh, they were deinstalled, but I actually ended up reusing them and making them into a different project so 
they're gone. <laughs> they are. Yeah, this was from 2016. And I have a funny story. So the the um, little adobes, that's when I first worked with them. I went on Craigslist for this and someone had like a free a free uh, a, a Craigslist list for adobes. And I went over there and it was this guy in, in Old Town and it was his great grandfather's home that was collapsing and he was just giving away the adobes. And I got them and and um when I took them home, a lot of them were kind of falling apart. So I made my own wooden form and I started to kind of take them apart again to re recreate the forms. And while I was doing that, I found uh, newspaper clippings from like the 20s or 40s or something and rolling papers uh, ads. And it just was like this moment that I had where it felt like I was kind of like an archaeologist finding ghosts in the past and especially because I grew up in the South Valley and in Old Town and it felt like seeing remnants of of um, history in this earth that was in a home you know and so that was this moment I had that felt very uh, that has kept with me and so just the first time because I only had a small portion but I was also working with with the at least Yeah, the the Alice. So it's A L I Z. Oh, Oda La Fuente. Yeah, it's just on my website. Oda a La Fuente. Oda O D A. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's on my website. And so, um, this is another example of some paperwork and wire and dye work that I did recently for a solo exhibition at Site Santa Fe last fall, and. Um, just thinking about form work and um, the, uh, working with uh, the cochineal and indigo and walnut hole and yeah and so I just wanted to show this work as well because I feel like it ties in with natural materials and fiber and I guess one of the other reasons why I've been really interested in paper is there's an old practice of actually wallpapering the inside of Adobe homes. And so you can find in some really beautiful, like uh, dilapidating older homes, you can sometimes find just this, this old wallpaper. And so I've always been interested in this, this uh, play between mud and paper and, and architecture, I suppose. And so, yeah, so thinking about architectural space and the body um so uh after that first experience that i had i ended up working with another artist ruben Olguin, on a project with new mexico arts art in public places and him and i collaborated on a project and we made all of these adobes in bernalillo and so this is when i first started really getting into it we made a bunch of these at his family's property and just dug a big um pit and mixed and one thing I was mixing the mud with my feet and I stepped on a big nail. So don't ever do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had to go get a tetanus shot. Um, so I was talking about the Elise earlier and I, Elise comes from the Spanish verb alisar, which means to smooth or polish. And I apprenticed with women in Northern New Mexico, Anita Rodriguez and Carol Cruz. Um, who, so this is Anita, and she's amazing. She is a, an incredible painter and inharadora. So inharadora means um, a woman plasterous, what mud woman plasterous, and it comes from the verb enharar to mud plaster. And there's an old tradition of making adobe homes where men would lay the adobes and like the vigas, and then women would do the beautification aspect of mudding and to inharar. Um, and so Anita actually had her own construction company in Taos for like 20 years called Inharadora, where she built Adobe homes and a lot of, did a lot of ornos and, um, fireplaces. And she's amazing. She has a book called Coyote in the Kitchen. I really recommend, uh, Coyote in the Kitchen, mm -hmm. Coyote, like a coyote, but a female oh, coyote. coyote, Coyote, yeah. And so this is us um, finding the uh, 
vialis in the form of caliche. So it's, you can see it often when you're driving and they have a cut in the road and there's like a vein and it's like a slightly different color and maybe it's a cream color, maybe it's green, maybe it's yellow, maybe it's brown um, or black or gray. So this was a cream one and we were collecting it. And so um, this is screening the, the, um, the material. And then there's a whole process of adding water. And I've seen a lot of different ways people have done it. Um, sometimes people add um, like a like wheat paste or like a poliada of wheat paste, or this was with buttermilk. Um, I've done it with casein. So you can add something in it to help with the adhesion. And it's not always necessary, but it um, helps with like the dust, I believe. And so that makes it into alis. And alis is a very old tradition of painting the interior of adobe homes. Yeah, very old. And um, you see it in like indigenous Pueblo communities. You see it in like Mexicano, Hispano communities. Um, it gets very, it's a very unique and it's interior, very, yeah, it's interior. Um, you can do a mud slurry on the outside, you know, but, and so Anita had me redo her house and um, different places where it needed to be re, um, released. So she has a beautiful home in Taos. She actually studied with Hassan Fati. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's an Egyptian architect and he's Hassan Fati and he's really well known for domes. Um, vaults, I mean, and so she has one at her home. And this is a photo of Anita learning from another enjaradora in Taos when she was young. And so it was also something that she learned from elders in her community. So she's born and raised in Taos. And so um, it's definitely been an honor to learn from Anita and from Carol. And this is doing the, um, the mudding outside. And you know, one thing Anita always kind of stressed to me, or she has, is people did this out of necessity, you know, like that's what was available, that was what you had. And so, and I've just become very, very obsessed. <laughs> so um, this is Carol Cruz, and she's also from Taos, New Mexico. She grew up in Rancho de Taos, and she also had her own business um, as um, an, an, er an artist and um, natural builder, where she did a lot of Alice, I think it was called Gourmet Adobe, and she had it with her friend, Lori, and I think she was doing that, I'm not sure how long, maybe 15 years, but she's always been doing um, earthen plastering mud work in that area for, gosh, I don't know how long exactly, maybe 40 years or more. Sorry, Carol, if you're watching and I don't know exactly, but she's the sweetest and I really adore Carol. And we're actually doing a workshop together in um, next month in August on focused on plastering and the lease and pigments. So I'm really excited to do that with her. But um, so I also studied with Carol. We're doing it at her dome in Tres Orejas in, on the Mesa. And we're also doing it in Antonito um, in Southern Colorado. Yeah, so two different locations. And she wrote a book, Carol's very well known. I forgot to mention this. She's very well known for a book she wrote um, called Clay Culture plasters, paints, and preservation. I have used that book a lot, and it's an incredible book um, that gives a lot of context on, yeah, um, plasters, paints, and preservation with Adobe architecture. Hashi, I love her. She's the best. I was just staying with her in, in Taos recently, yeah. She is, she's such an amazing artist and does a lot. She actually inspired me a lot with um, paper making too. Yeah. She knows so much. Yeah. So this was um, when, I, when I was working with her or learning from her, 
we went to a few different locations, but this was a home she has in Talpa near Taos. And it was filling in the cracks with mud. And so you can kind of see, oh, can you see how that's happening? And kind of threw this one in there, but this, um, when we were in her home in Talpa, you could see these different layers of the Alice. And this is from, uh, this is actually from my grandfather's um, home, but I thought it, it was relevant because you could see like 20 different layers of different people throughout time in, in that home, having painted either the Alice or calcimine paint or even latex paint and just so many layers. And sometimes I think of it as like the tree rings of, of a tree, but instead it's like the family members are of a home with their own hands, you know, these different layers of time. And so this was from my grandfather's home. And I just thought it was so beautiful because it was so many different layers and so things like that I get really interested in as an artist. So this was what it looked like after kind of filling in the cracks with mud and um, yeah. Restoration is a big thing. Um, I also worked with her um, to help remud the, um, the Rancho de Taos church. So every year community members come together and do a whole uh, remudding of, of the church. And at one point the church was in like dire disrepair because they had chicken wired it and stuccoed it. Mm -hmm. And a big issue with that is you can't see the damage that's happening inside. And so adobe actually like um, hydrates uh, when it rains and then it dries. And so it almost kind of has its own like breathing that kind of happens. And when you put stucco on both sides and water gets in, it can't, it can't dry out. And so what happens often is these huge, um, if, it's, if it's not, you know, if there really is like a crack, which eventually happens, but what happened there was a lot of the adobe inside started to melt. Mm -hmm. And so then they took it apart, out, took all the chicken wire out. And I guess it was a huge mess. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, and so they decided to take all the chicken wire and all those stucco out and they remudded and now it's completely mudded. But the thing is you have to have a continuous reciprocal care with adobe homes if, if they're you know, um, unplastered, I mean, un unstuccoed. And, so, so anyway, it's really wonderful that the, the community comes together and does that because that's what it requires is reciprocal, reciprocal care. So these are different tools that come with the practice. There's a lot of them, especially if you're building an actual home, but as far as doing mud plastering, how many of you guys have ever mud plastered? Yeah, mud plastered, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of different kinds of tools and some of them Japanese trowels are my favorite. There's actually a whole earthen plastering tradition in Japan. They have the best ones and there's actually, the more I've gotten into this, the more I've seen earth and adobes all around the world. It's amazing. It's in Africa and China and the Middle East and all throughout Latino America and it's everywhere. It's it's kind of incredible. Um, so I began to start working with large scale sculptural installation with Adobe architecture um, about in 2016, I believe, 2017. And this was through New Mexico Arts, Art in Public Places. And it was in Edgewood, New Mexico in front of an animal shelter and a police station. And so I built this and it's a, um, it's a sculpture made out of adobe and it's with lime wash and mirrors. So I was working a lot with having like really simplistic materials like the adobe lime wash mirrors, but then with the mirrors, it would bring in the sky and the landscape and people and make it interactive and almost kind of create more materials in it, you know, um, but making it temporal. 
And so this was a really great one that I enjoyed. And it was about seven feet tall. And um, it was uh, kind of my first time making something and it was temporary as well. And so kind of interesting to do the work I do because all like other than one is permanent at the Harwood Art Center in Albuquerque, but otherwise they all come down. It's all temporary. No, I, yeah, they all. They all transition just like us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is another one that I did at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, a part of the State of the Art ex, um, exhibition. So uh, curators from the Crystal Bridges Museum went around the US for I think six months and they wanted to represent artists that weren't just from LA and New York. So they met with different artists in different states and to represent more of a, um, uh, like a, like a, a better view of the United States artists and like who are, who are um, artists today. So, so this was some work that I did and this was also with mirrors. And so it was with this turquoise and, and yellow mirror and the Elise. Um, this was a work, this is in progress. This was a work I did at Blue Star Contemporary in San Antonio last year. And I just wanted to show this one because it kind of gives an idea of um, the, the construction. So when I go in, I bring a bunch of adobes on pallets that are there and a whole bunch of dirt. And then I usually work with the preparators and teach them how to build. And there's a lot of leveling that happens in plum because you have to make sure they're, it's, it's very straight. <laughs> uh, it's harder than you think. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of this. And usually I'm at the museums or the galleries for like a week and a half. And so I get to know the, the staff pretty well. And this is mud plastering it. And so I like to think of the work I'm doing kind of like just being like a very large scale ceramicist, but building on site. And so that's how I've been liking to think about it. And so this is mud mudding it. This is freshly mud plastered. There is an entire refinement process that is um, very uh, important and also varies between artists. Uh, there are other artists who work with Adobe and some allow it to crack. Uh, mine often I'm, I've gotten really interested in how to smooth and refine it and paint it. And so this, um, this was one of, this is uh, one view of the work. It was called the Adobe Color Laboratory. And it was where I was built an installation, large scale installation. And then I was exploring and experimenting, like creating a little laboratory within the gallery space of colors. And so all of these colors, except for the blue, are all um, wild clays that you can, that were either I found or were given to me. And so the yellow one is from San Luis in Southern Colorado, the red one, is from, I believe, Ojinaga in Northern Me Mexico, where my friend Sandro gave to me. And the blue is um, a mix of the green, which the green is from Terlingua in West Texas. And the, the blue is just the green as a base. And then I added a little bit of blue and white pigment to it. And the, the cream color is what I found with Anita. And so just wanted to kind of show that. Oh, and uh, the works on the walls were kind of these little paintings just as, as studies. And so this was what it looked like at the end and it's about seven foot in height and then about nine foot in width and about a foot, um, a foot in width, nine in length. Yeah, the backside was unplastered. Mortars that create curves. So. Yeah, yeah, there is a lot of cutting, though. Of, yeah, cutting them. But yeah, uh huh, yeah. And um, I'll show some more work where it's pretty 
yeah, it's pretty fun. You could just use the, the mud mortar and, and create really interesting shapes that way. Does the mortar have Yeah, yeah, I can add straw. So there's a kind of like a suggested um, ratio of 30% clay to 70% sand. That makes a nice mix for other way. Um, it varies region to region. The more clay you have in it, the more per, um, impermeable uh, or resistant it is to water. Um, but if it's too much clay, then it'll crack a lot. And um, so I guess my question yeah. is the, the, the mortar is the same material. As yes. The mm -hmm. It just hasn't been dry. Exactly. Yeah. It hasn't had like the form. Yeah. Yeah. And um, sometimes, yeah. And I'll add, add straw as well sometimes. So this was also in the um, Adobe Color Laboratory. And so I included a map with color-coded little dots to um, where the clays were found in different little tests that I did and miniature adobes, adobitos, um, just sketches and Polaroids just to kind of show the process of, along with the work because the process is a big thing with what I'm doing and I tried to share that with this with this work. Yeah. How do you cut the block? Uh, yeah. Um, well, there's a few different ways. Um, you, there's something called a rake saw that you can use. Um, you can use a bow saw for cutting branches. Um, you can use an actual saw, but it'll kind of cut it up. There's an actual tool I use called a rake saw that's really great. And some people those, that'll make a very precise cut. And then you use a chisel and a hammer. So you kind of um, go around about three, three, three quarters of an inch and then use a chisel. But some people aren't as precise, especially for, I'm doing this in like museums where I need it to be really specific for my, my work. But some people just kind of use like a shovel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or drop it or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is another work that um, is still that's actually a permanent work I have in Albuquerque in front of the Montessori School at the Harwood Arts Center, and this is when I started thinking about um, the engagement of of how people engage with the work and bringing like the human body or people. And this was just a little girl from the Montessori School. I'll just play it one more time because I think it's so magical. Someone just like it caught it. I know, it's so sweet. <laughs> and so I started thinking about performance and incorporating um, performance because so much of the work I'm doing comes from people and comes from engagement. And I wanted it to make it feel like creating a space and then creating like activating and having um, the space more than um, like for, for gathering or coming together. So um, I got a Andy Warhol Foundation grant quite a while ago now, maybe six, five years ago. And it was for um, public um, like outreach. And so I built this sculpture, pretty similar to the one in Edgewood actually, because I wanted to focus on the performance. And so I organized a performance of women coming together and giving them a platform to, to um, uh, express like either music or poetry. Um, Ray Red did a shadow puppetry uh, work where she actually um, projected the, the shadow puppetry on the sculpture and then did singing. And it was really beautiful. And this is my friend Najonia. She, she's really wonderful artist and musician in Santa Fe. And so this was with Ray Red projecting the work um, on and it was just so amazing to bring other people into it. And I've been finding I actually get the most out of that is, is either working with people or having, yeah, more collaborative ways of, of working. I, I really enjoy it. So um, I just did an exhibition in, at the Sarasota Art Museum. And I, I'm gonna go into more of the sculpture later, but I also 
hosted performances where musicians from the Southwest came and um, we had, yeah, we had like a performance and the, the work is called Clay Song. And so I wanted it to be um, thinking about, I'm thinking more and more about how this practice of working with clay and is kind of like a ritual and also sort of like, like medicine as well and how song is also medicine and how to kind of create more of, of that because we need, we need more um, things that, that feel really good. So this was uh, Kateri and Greg. Um, they have a band called Iho, and it was just really, it was just really fun to include that. And so sometimes I think about like, oh, you know, you're um, a ceramicist or you're a painter, and it's. I've been thinking like, well, how how do you make it like? Why not performance as well and making it more multidisciplinary and and event based. And so Karima Walker also came. She's an artist from artist and musician from Tucson. It was really, really cool to have her as well. So um, I also wanted to just bring up other ways that I work with other people. Um, this is Antonio Marquez. He is a director. He makes films. And so this was where he hired me to come on to a set and design the, the um, film set. So this was a, a hakal. Um, a hakal is, it's a really old way of building with uh, like logs and branches, and then you mud the outside and the inside. And so he wanted to create this is it. So they built this and then they, he hired me to come in and help mud plaster it and then kind of lead a team to kind of to, to do it. And it's for a film called Baca the Kid where there, it's actually historical where it was the longest shootout in history. Somewhere in Southern New Mexico near Socorro, I think. And uh, yeah, and so he was shooting the film and it was going to be him shooting in there and um, the shootout. And so it was just really fun to to go and help kind of lead that um, as a set design. So this is the film. Yeah, yeah. And so just kind of fun to think. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that cool? And that was what it looked like when it was all finished. Um, but it was kind of funny because we we got the, the, the dirt that he, he got and, and he got from someone in town, it was in Southern Colorado. And the guy brought all this, God, I don't even know what it was. It, was, it wasn't actually earth, like clay. <laughs> and it was just so funny that we just had to do a lot of actually like, like this isn't actually the right material, you know, and, and figuring it out. And so just thinking about being an artist, but then also collaborating again with other creatives on their projects for like set design. I, it just came out too. It's it's a short film. So I've been thinking a lot about how to make um, like Adobe architecture like accessible just as a learning tool. And so I created this product called Adobecitos. Um, miniature Adobe is usually just called Adobitos, but I just I thought other ways this was kind of cute. And so it's 30 miniature um, miniature adobes and then a bag of dirt and a patita, a little wooden spoon. And um, on it is also, I wanted it to be like a learning tool. So I have a glossary of terms. Um, adobe, sun-dried bricks made of mud and straw, adobero or adobera, um, a person who makes adobes, Alice, been mentioning that, a clay slip painted on interior walls, Chante is a small home, in Haradora or in Harador, a person who mud plasters, in Hare, mud plaster, orno, an adobe oven, Palita, small shovel, and Zoquete, which is a word for mud that comes from Nahuatl. So um, just to kind of, yeah, kind of, create more um, like education around it. And so this was 
little instructions, the ingredients. Thanks, yeah, thanks. Well thanks. Yeah. It was really fun to come up with. Um, I don't know. I've always been kind of interested in product design and designing and like figuring out the stamps and the font and the packaging. And I, I actually really enjoy that kind of thing. And so I also have a little history on here. Um, although it has been in use by indigenous peoples of the Americas and the southwestern United States, Mesoamerica and the Andes for thousands of years. In New Mexico, Puebloan people built their structures using adobe placed by hand until the Spanish introduced wooden forms for making bricks to the region, a technology which traveled to Spain from North Africa. Adobe is among the earliest building materials known to civilization and is used throughout the world. But yeah, so I just wanted it to, um, yeah, be this like easier way to work with it because adobes are actually like they're 30 pounds. They're pretty heavy, so this makes it a little more accessible. Uh, when I did the site Santa Fe show, they actually asked me if I wanted to have something in the store during the time of my show, so I made this. Um, and then I also teach a class through Atlas Obscura. You guys have heard them of them. They're kind of like Lonely Planet, and I had this as one of the as one of the um, required materials, but it turned out to be a little harder to ship them because the UPS is really aggressive with the packages. And so I've been meaning to like maybe sell them through a, a store, but I don't think it's best to ship them. So I, I, I kind of took a break because I made like 60 of them. <laughs> and, and I think it would be better to just have them some people can just pick them up and Do you have to have any with you? I, I know I should have made I should make I think I burned myself out a little bit I and I have that. I kind of haven't been doing them but I, I actually should because I have all of all the stuff to make them and everything so um along with um every all the other things um that I've been showing you, I also teach workshops on Adobe architecture, introduction to Adobe architecture and mud plastering with my friend, Helen Levine. And Helen is so sweet. She owns the uh, Adobe manufacturing yard in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's there's only two of them that are left on large scale Adobe manufacturing in New Mexico. And Mel Medina is the other guy who has one, but I don't, I wonder, there's some, he, he may or may not be like selling it. So her and her brother, Mark Levine, run New Mexico Earth is what it's called. And her father, Richard Levine, began it in the 70s. So she's been working there since she's been like 18 or 19, both her and her brother run it. And they're just the sweetest people. And they're so hardworking. And I got to know her because I was buying a lot of adobes from her for the work I was doing. And I was getting a lot of interest from people wanting to like learn. And I just was like, hey, do you wanna, do, you wanna do some workshops? Like, do you wanna do a workshop together? And it's become a whole thing now. <laughs> and yeah, and it's been, it's been amazing. We've taught at least 20 of them now. Did she do um, uh, standard adobe or did she like do the she does the yeah she does um semi fully stabilized and and um unstabilized with emulsified as well yeah uh-huh yeah they are and if you want any you have to give her a heads up because they sell everything oh, we've all. Already got a bill. oh really oh okay yeah yeah so so we teach um we teach soil composition uh, we get a, she gives a tour of the yard. We go over different types of soil tests to kind of understand clay to sand ratios. We make adobe bricks. We go over introduction to foundations, different types of tools. Uh, we teach construction methods. So uh, laying adobes, the mortar, um, leveling, plumbing. I feel like I should have this, this uh, this class be introduction to Adobe architecture, mud plastering and leveling because <laughs> like it's so much leveling. I don't think people realize how, how um, yeah. <laughs> but 
We, so we do that and then um, we have a, a conversation where we go over history and politics and codes um, and organizations who are working in the field. And we, t uh, we also teach some of the other these. Do you have any colleagues here in the Southwest? Colleagues? Anyone you work with, built with in our region of New Mexico? In Silver City? Yeah, Silver City or around? Oh, around there. Um, uh, I have a friend, Sandro Canovas, who's in Marfa, Texas. Um, yeah, he's over there. Um, and then I know there's a few people over here, but I don't, I don't work with them. Okay. But I hear about I hear about people over here. Yeah, yeah. So I also teach how to make um, Adobe arches, and I teach mud plastering. So yeah, I feel like uh, there is it Pat Taylor who's out here and Crucis. Pat Taylor. Yeah. There was just a big conference on earth and architecture called the the Terra conference in Santa Fe. So that was, it's a worldwide um, conference on architecture, Adobe architecture heritage. It was pretty amazing. I just went to that, but I just met him. He's in Crucis, but Pat Taylor, I know he's around here, but so this is Helen and Mark. <laughs> and those are all their Adobes behind it. <laughs> yeah, they, it's amazing. It's a lot of work. It's incredible. Somebody told me that when you're doing a building construction, that you should move into where you can work. Yeah. Because <laughs> they lay, they lay the mud, the mud gets laid, and they have to like push the mud into the, the, um, the forms, pick up the forms, and then the adobes kind of dry after about, I don't know, a week or a few days, and then put them on their sides, and then you have to get the dirt off of the back side with this one tools, so they have to go through and clean all the backs. Yeah. yeah, and then, I mean, I guess from there you. Yeah, it's a lot of moving around. They're pretty strong. So one of the things that is becoming, with the workshops that we've been doing is been interesting because it's been getting people nationally and a lot of people moving to New Mexico who like why people are doing that, why they're taking the workshop. And a lot of times they want to either build a home, like build an Adobe home with land they just got, or maybe it's heritage relationships, they, um, which is a common one. Often it's people who moved in and they bought a house and they want to understand the Adobe home they have. But Helen's been saying how a lot of people want to build with it, but not that many people want to like learn about the production side and get into production of making the adobes. And that's what's really needed because at some point, Helen and Mark, like they're trying to figure out what they're going to do because at some point with the business um, and just if you, you know, if you guys know of anyone who wants to start getting into the adobe manufacturing, it's really needed. Yeah, very, very needed. And they're busy. I think they want to relax soon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, this was this was another uh, restoration workshop I did in Southern Colorado. Um, so that was an Endangered Places grant um, at this place called the Lafayette Head. As um, it was like an old Indian agency actually, and. There's a lot of ghosts there, but we came together as a big group and volunteers and it was all funded to come and do restorations. So there's a lot of, and this was with Ronald Rael, um, who's an architect, a professor of architecture and um, taught that with him. And, and so there's so many old buildings that need restoration. That's a really big thing. And one organization that focuses on that is Cornerstones Community Partnerships. They're in Santa Fe and they um, literally work with especially old churches and um, uh, Chimayo, the plaza there, they, and um, National Park Service, they do a lot of restoration and you can do volunteer with them and they're amazing. 
just so you know. Um, this was when I was doing my solo show at Site Santa Fe, and I actually hosted a workshop to help me build the work. So I had pe 10 people from around the US uh, volunteered and came, and I taught them myself and Isaac Logsdon, who is the site director of Cornerstones. He helped me teach. We taught 10 people to build the sculptures in two days at the museum. Cause I was like, how am I gonna build this? You know, like I can't do this with just two people or cause it was so meant, it was four large works. So we got everybody and and uh, it was interesting because a lot of people who came were um, kind of in maybe into art history or were architects. Um, and it's interesting the female presence. Yeah. And yeah. 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 I mean, you know, when I got into this, it was like, well, I can't do all this by myself, you know. And I mean, you li it's literally something you do with other people. It's wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, uh huh, yeah. These questions. It's okay. Um, I'm curious why you, is it your own technique to lay the bricks like you do? or Like doing the double, yeah. Alternating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just, I started doing that because it helps with the way I'm building them. And they're like, the, it helps with the frame, like the form work that I'm doing. Huh. Yeah, uh, but that's not, he's talking about the double, how I'm double laying them, and that's not the traditional kind of way. So. I've noticed it's, uh, we, we have an adobe house, and it's emulsified adobe, so you can see the, the seams and everything, but I, I notice it's done differently than brick, but brick, every, like every six courses, they reverse the brick mm. to, for structural reasons. Yeah. Uh, but you don't have to do that. There's a lot of different uh, brick patterns too that are pretty beautiful. And oftentimes adobe is like mud plastered as mud plaster is like a protective skin to keep the adobe safe. But then this emulsified asphalt that we've been talking about is a um, stabilizer. And so you don't necessarily have to mud plaster it. You can have it exposed and it won't erode as quickly. So this was the work when it was finished, and um, I thank you. And I was I was kind of thinking so this work is like thinking about it was sort of like half moons is what I was um, thinking as far as the forms and playing with mud the the mud plaster and sort of wrapping around and thinking about the different clays clay colors and this is a mix of wild clays and um powdered pigment and so just sort of these i think of all of these sort of as studies and then also about architectural space and how it kind of this large-scale sculpture kind of forces you to almost like walk in a certain way or like having like the earth rise up to meet you um is kind of i think it has a certain kind of energy to it and also kind of thinking about painting and I guess with social practice as pedagogy of teaching. And the clay, it, the, the skin of it, it looks so smooth because I, I do a lot of refinement of it. It cracks, <laughs> mud cracks. So there's a lot of like filling in those cracks like I showed with Carol and going over with a sponge. And um, this is that green clay from Terra Lingua. My friend Samaro gave me and yeah, kind of just thinking about these um, almost like little paintings unto itself. And this work was actually a dual show with that paperwork. And so it was called Landcraft Theater. So I was thinking about land and sky and earthen pigments and um, botanical dyes. Um, so 
kind of starting to wrap up a little bit, just a couple more projects. Um, this was one I did recently this spring, and it was over at 516. It's a little contemporary museum in downtown Albuquerque. And the whole exhibition was about archives and um, yeah, and thinking about history in New Mexico. And so I took the exhibition um, as an opportunity to really think about Lopezville. This is called Lopezville, Socorro, New Mexico. And I, there's a lot in this project, but I went ahead and I did a lot of research about Socorro and thought about deconstructing this process of making adobe. So I brought in a lot of the dirt that's on my, my family land out there. And on, in the dirt is a whole bunch of trash and bottles and liquor bottles and plastic. And it's just generations of family members just throwing stuff outside. And so kind of screening it and making the adobes. And I didn't test them because I figured they were good because they built the homes. Perfect adobes, they were amazing incredible um but it was also the, that blue um this this is that month of the techo i was talking about that was that cloth that hangs beneath the vegas to catch the dirt and you don't see it very often it's but it was i went ahead and and brought that this is um those were some of the liquor bottle shards so i was thinking a lot about memory in land and on lopezville um, there's been a lot of alcoholism in the family. And so you can like literally see that uh, in the land. And um, next door that mentioned um, the New Mexico Tech, they actually used to do testing uranium, um, depleted uranium uh, projectile missiles testing open air in the 70s and 80s. And our land is... Um, the last thing to the mountain where they'd have a Terra, it's called the Terra facility, uh, Terra testing. And um, so you can, it's, it's very close. You can just, it's in the mountain and you, you saw the mountain where it was. My father, Demacio Lopez actually worked as an activist against depleted uranium his entire life and got very, very um, deep into these issues. And so depleted uranium is something that they actually put on the missile tip, uh, the tips of missiles to make them, it basically makes it like impenetrable. Um, and I mean, it's just kind of intense. They don't do the open air testing anymore. They do them underground. And I don't know if they're still testing that particularly, but my father has all of these, for these documents that he shared with me. And I actually put them up on the walls, there's a couple of them that literally state um, this, these agreements to pollute land with radioactivity. And so just thinking about land as um, traditional practices, um, land as memory, like land as, as maps as well. So I included uh, different maps of Socorro and then it used to also be a Pueblo, an, an indigenous village. And so included different maps of that. And, and so just thinking about how different ways land is thought of through actually having the dirt on site to having these agreements to pollute the land. And yeah, it's, it's really intense. And so it, it just makes me think a lot about like what's in, what's in the dirt that you're working with, you know? Um, there could be a lot, of, a lot of things, like it could be to the memory of, whatever used to like whoever used to live there to uh whatever was maybe left um contamination it could be so many different things i mean and so this was a pretty personal project to to do but it was uh pretty pretty fascinating so no it came down yeah yeah yeah, so I've just been thinking about that. My, my parents actually met over those issues. My, my mother um, was working on a documentary called The River That Harms, one of the largest radioactive waste spill in US history. It happened in Church Rock, New Mexico on uh, the Navajo Nation. So at the time it went very much untelevised and it was about two hours west of Albuquerque. And she was doing her, um, she was getting her journalism degree at USC and did a documentary and 
was on, on site for like two years working on that and they met over these issues. And so along growing up, I've just been very much aware of um, the reality that New Mexico has been a place of contamination and um, like a sacrificial state in a lot of ways. And I don't think a lot of the tourists know that when they move here, <laughs> but it, it really is. And so I think about that as well, as, along with making this work that I'm making that's very, it can be very romanticized with this, you know, the the, the enjarando and the in the plastering and it's it's really it's beautiful because it is this beautiful tradition but just also thinking about the the reality of um the different testing that's happened in new mexico unfortunately so um this was actually one of my favorite works that i have done so far uh, it is called the one called clay song and it's over at the Sarasota Art Museum currently. And um, I'm actually really happy with it. <laughs> yeah, the Sarasota, it's in Florida. Yeah, so it's, fun. Um, it's actually a part of the traveling exhibition with the Crystal Bridges Museum show. So I'm going to be doing another iteration at the Akron Art Museum later this year in Ohio. And for each one, I'm gonna be building a different a different work. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It's, so all the other these are, tri are are shipped and then and then build on site and, and that is also with um, the yellow is from that yellow clay from San Luis that I actually collected and the white is with actually the stuff from Anita and the green is from my friend Sandro and then the and then the um, brown. So again, just thinking of like large scale work almost as like, like a large scale um, ceramic work. Yeah, yeah. And then kind of like bringing the human body and also thinking about how can some of this work become like functional um, design that invites the body. And so I'm thinking about that more going forward and um, I also, I'm also a performer and a musician, so I'm trying to think of how to incorporate more of the, that with collaborative um, practice with others. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, or actually, I, I muddied it on the back. Yeah. No, it's just um, just the brown. Thank you. You said that these get disassembled or destroyed. They'll be disassembled, and then the other ways will be reused again. So you can reuse them and reuse them. Yeah. So this work will then go to um, the Akron. But I'm I'm actually working with a collector in Santa Fe, and I think I might be making like a permanent one like this for him. Hopefully. I wouldn't reuse the color on this. I would use that afresh. And I'm going to be showing you in um, the next room with a demonstration of the Alice and the different colors and how I process it and how um, you would paint that onto, onto earth. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you spoke to. Um the gifts of the colors from various friends and colleagues. So I, I would get the resonance for you there. What else, what else, you, 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 this is what, this is your favorite work. You really love this work. Can you speak more about why that is? Or? Yeah, I just, um, I really love the shape. I feel like it's a very sensuous shape and um, the color patterns and the size and the way that there is almost like a place to uh, like it's symmetrical, but then it's also um, kind of catches your eye in different ways. Like your eye kind of moves around it, mm -hmm. and just sort of the feeling of the work. It's kind of it's like pinpointing like oh, I want to go for like more towards this direction. Yeah, and so. I just feel really lucky to be given opportunities to keep these uh, like experiments pretty much in practicing. You kind of got to see a little bit as it's de been developing and um, the different types of works and um, designs. 
So, yeah. Oh, she's Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh huh. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me, I really love the work of Anna Mendieta. Um, do you guys know her? She was Anna Mendieta. I think, that Anna, I think it's Anna Mendieta. She, um, she, uh, I think she was in like, I forget the exact years, but she did a lot of work with the body in land. And so she was more going out into landscape and then maybe like uh, digging out a certain area and then photographing, having herself photograph like her body inland. And, and you guys should look her up. She actually kind of died a tragic death, but um, she's really a really interesting artist. So think about, I've been thinking about that, like ways of bringing in the body and then performance. And um, I want to, I want to explore more. So I'm going to get my master's at Stanford in the fall in my MFA. And so I'm looking forward, thank you. So I'm looking forward to experimenting more and also how to make like works on like large works on walls with the Elise and almost like as large paintings possibly. So yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, if it's interior and you know you're not running up against it all the time or anything, like it'll just last and last. But if it's outside, it's just not meant for out there. But yeah, it'll be fine inside if it's not touched. Yeah. No, I don't I don't think so because it's it's like minerals. Yeah. Yeah. I could be wrong though. With certain ones, they're all so different. So I'll show you the the colors I have in the other room. They're they're all like the textures are different. The the uh, sand to clay ratios are all different. Um, yeah. Uh huh. Oh yeah, Alexa. Thank you, Alexa, for having me and organizing everything for me to come here. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Expanding that circle of what clay is and how we interpret it. You know, I didn't realize so much of the Yeah. You know, I was so glad to connect with you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And you have works you have been taught by Yeah. It seems a really important part of your your becoming. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love women. <laughs> Hanging out with women and learning and working with other women. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah.